Hi friends, would you like to hear an amazing fact? In 2018, there was a group of soccer students in Thailand who after practice with their coach decided to explore a cave and that cave was two and a half miles through narrow tunnels back in a mountain. But unfortunately, while they were back there, monsoon rains came and flooded the tunnels, trapping them back there. They had no food with them. Gradually, their batteries gave out and there they were, the 13 of them trapped in the dark. Well, eventually families that came and saw their bicycles and backpacks knew where they had gone. They knew what happened and an international rescue attempt was activated. 10,000 people got involved in trying to rescue those boys in that soccer team. There were a hundred expert divers, cave divers from around the world that came. They had to bring oxygen in because they were running out of oxygen. They had no food. They were licking the drinking water from the walls of the stalactites. And after two weeks, one by one, they brought the boys out. But one diver died in the process, bringing oxygen to the boys. He did not have enough for himself when he returned. You know, in the Bible, it tells stories of God saving people from dark caves also. We're going to talk about it in this presentation of Revelation Now. friends welcome again to revelation now and we are joining you from the new granite bay worship center here in granite bay california you notice the stage is a little different than what we've been having for our regular revelation now seminar uh, so we want to welcome you this is a big day for us this is actually the first time that we're able to meet in this facility so we want to welcome those joining us across the country and around the world our extended uh, audience for this Revelation Bible Prophecy Seminar. I'd also like to welcome those who are joining us in person. We have folks scattered out throughout the auditorium, and a very warm welcome to all of you. We're just delighted to see you here today. Well, today we have a very important presentation. Uh, Pastor Doug will be sharing something that uh, I think you'll be encouraged by. And uh, to give him as much time as possible for our program, I'm going to ask him to come out right now, and we will have our opening prayer, and we will turn the time over to him. We are going to be taking Bible questions, uh, so immediately following the presentation by Pastor Doug this evening, we will be, or this morning, I should say, we are going to be taking your Bible questions. So if you're watching on Facebook, you can still type in your Bible question, and we'll try and answer as many of them as possible. Well, good morning, Pastor Doug. Good morning, Pastor Ross. This is an exciting day for us here. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer, and then I know you're going to get right into it. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the opportunity to be able to gather together. And what a joy to meet in this new facility. And Lord, we ask your special blessing upon the presentation today. We ask that your spirit would speak to all of our hearts, Lord, and just encourage us with your goodness, your love, your power, your ability to change our hearts and lives. And we commit ourselves in your keeping. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And we will be back with Bible questions in a little time. Good morning, friends. Good morning. And for those who are watching, who have been following us in our Revelation program, I'd like to wish you a happy Sabbath, because this is Sabbath morning at the time of this broadcast. Today I'm going to be doing something a little different from our regular Revelation study. You know, the Bible tells us in Revelation they overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So I, I do want to use Revelation, but, um, and I also, I promised I was gonna give special greetings to a friend. I've got a friend, I said, I will wave at you. That friend knows who that is right now. <laughs> and so I uh, want to bless, uh, wish them a special greeting as well. You know, this morning I'm gonna be sharing my personal testimony about uh, how I came to the Lord and I'll tell you, it's, it's uh, surreal for us right now at Amazing Facts because this is our first day in this new facility that since concept, it's been 20 years since concept, uh, 10 years I think, at least since we bought the property, and we are just praising the Lord. And this is, you're thinking October 31st, Halloween. This is October 31st, Reformation Day. This is 503 years after Martin Luther and nailed that thesis on the door of Wittenberg and sort of that became the catalyst for a great reformation of Scripture. 
You know, before I do get into my testimony, we just talked about an amazing fact of how these boys were saved from a, a dark cave. There's a similar story in the Bible. Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, Mark chapter 5, verse 1. And they came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, no, not even with chains, because he'd often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And the Bible says, and he wore no clothes in the Gospel of Luke. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he worshiped him. Now this is a picture of the most lost person in the Bible. I challenge you to find someone else in Scripture who is in a more lost condition than this. They are running around naked up in the mountains, dragging chains. They're living like an animal. They're cutting themselves with stones. The Bible tells us, you read the whole story, they're surrounded by pigs. They come out of a tombstone. Uh, this, for the Jewish mind, if you cut yourself and there's blood, it's unclean. If you're near the dead, it's unclean. If you're surrounded by pigs, it's unclean. And so this man is lost, hopeless, unclean, possessed by the enemy. It looks like an absolutely hopeless situation. This man represents the devil's plan for humanity. But fortunately, on the beach that day was God's plan for humanity reflected in the life of Jesus. There are only two plans. You've got the devil's plan for you, look at that man. You've got God's plan for you, you look at Jesus. Now when I read this story, it, it uh, always makes me think a little bit about my own experience. And I want to be careful because, you know, whenever you share your testimony, I'm human. And um, it's real easy for a person to talk about themselves. It's kind of like the uh, two actors at the cocktail party in Beverly Hills. And one of them was just going on and on about their career. And she finally caught herself and she said, I'm sorry, I've spent all this time talking about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? <laughs> and so there's that risk involved when you're, you know, sharing your testimony or that things could get bigger than life, like the little girl who uh, wanted to do a book report and make a good impression. And the book report was on Abraham Lincoln. So when she finally came to the front of the class, she really waxed eloquent. She said, Abraham Lincoln was born at an early age in a log cabin he built with his own hands. So we want to be realistic. Uh, the story I'm going to share with you is I'm going to give you an abbreviated version. It is found in a book, and we just praise the Lord. A book's over 30 years old, and it's in 18 different languages. It's just gone around the world, and we've heard wonderful testimonies of people that came to the Lord through the book. And I was always shocked personally by that. You know, I think it's interesting that some of the most popular literature in North America, believe it or not, is what you would call supermarket tabloid magazines. And they have some of the most bizarre titles. I remember one that said, I, I don't buy them. I did buy a couple because it wants to take pictures of the covers. But reading them in the checkout stand, come on, how many of you will admit you have read the headlines of some of those while you're waiting to check out? Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Discovered in a Meat Freezer. I remember that was one of them I never could forget. And they've all got these bizarre prophecies. And usually they have to do with the people in Hollywood that are getting married because people are obsessed with the rich and the famous, the beautiful. People think if I was more popular, better looking, famous, if I had more money, then I'd be happy. But I'm here to tell you that happiness does not come from fame and fortune. It doesn't come from money. Jesus said a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. I had a couple of unusual parents. That's my mom and dad. That's uh, one of the few pictures I have where they're actually smiling. And uh, they were what you would call polar opposites. My father was a redneck. My mother was a hippie. My father was born in Oklahoma. My mother in New York City. She was a Republican. She was a Democrat. It was a miracle that the marriage lasted six years. Uh, but during that time... Uh, yeah, she, he wanted a wife that would stay home and take care of the babies. She wanted a career in Hollywood, and she was an actress and a songwriter, and they just had a lot of problems. But during that time, my brother and I were born. And um, 
I learned something just because of the perspective that I've come from. Let me talk a little bit about dad, and it's an interesting story. Uh, Dad was a pilot even before World War II. He grew up with uh, no father. Father died when he was seven. Mother had four boys during the Depression. You've heard of the Dust Bowl. My dad lived in Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl, fled to California just like grapes of wrath, learned to fly. When the war broke out, he entered the war as an officer. He flew D-Day, actually the day after D-Day, from England to, to Europe, and he was also an instructor, captain in the Air Force, had medals. After the war, he began to buy and sell aircraft and um, ended up, at one point, he owned two airlines, an airline leasing company, international air leases. He was friends with people like Kurt Kikorian, Howard Hughes, and um, owned controlling interest in Western Airlines. He owned Capital Airlines, international air leases, Aero Air. He's a very wealthy, very successful man, workaholic, had a lot of money. Uh, George Batchelor, Miami's Mr. Aviation, uh, another magazine, the most influential person of the year. That's, that was a Florida magazine. And he had the toys that millionaires have. Uh, that was his yacht. It was called the Bachelor Party. And he had Rolls Royce. And I took this picture off Google Earth. That's where we lived. He lived on Sunset Island Number 1 in Biscayne Bay. And we had three boats in the backyard. And uh, our neighbors were millionaires that lived on that island. Uh, some of you have uh, maybe heard of Firestone Tires. I used to date Amy Firestone. Sorry, dear. Nothing like you, though. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Hoover vacuum cleaner. The family played with us. The folks that made crisscross boats and the old public storage. And just we knew all these kids living on the island. And I just saw that money didn't bring happiness. Uh, every night, my father would drink himself to sleep because of all the stress. I had a lot of money. He had millions of dollars. He raced cars. He could water ski. He was very active. He flew planes. He thankfully helped me get my pilot's license. And, and uh, private jets. That's a picture of my dad, uh, one of his Lear jets. And, and I, he had a home in Aspen, Colorado, and just all the, the toys. And that was just a, a whole different life from what I live now, let me assure you. Here's a newspaper clipping from Miami. Uh, the Miami Herald, at 71, aviation pioneer George Batchelor isn't ready to descend. He runs one of Miami's most successful businesses, pilots jets, races cars, water skis, and is soon to take a bride, 29. <laughs> this was, uh, my mom was wife number two. Wife number one died in a plane crash with his son. My, uh, yeah, Karen, I, I've got a brother buried down in Sacramento, actually. Um, Wife number three, married to Betty. She was Miss Kentucky for 30 years. A very sweet lady. But uh, he was still looking for happiness, and so that fell apart. And uh, you can see that in the Miami Herald, it said one of the largest settlements in Florida history, 17.3 or $17.5 million alimony settlement. Um, and that's with a prenuptial agreement. So here's dad with wife number four. And that's my brother. Now, my brother, Falcon. Falcon and I were named after airplanes. Uh, I was named Douglas after the McDonnell Douglas DC-3. And Falcon was named after, I don't know, Falcon Fanjet. But he had a tough time because uh, he had flaming red hair. And uh, we were same mother and father, but we, same, we were the same size. I could change clothes with him. But he had bright red hair, freckles, brown eyes. I've got blue eyes, no freckles, no hair. And... Uh, <laughs> But he was my brother, and, but he had cystic fibrosis. So he always struggled all his life, and that was his wife, Sandy. There's my dad with his 29-year-old bride, who, by the way, was younger than my wife. In fact, if you want to, just a few uh, trivia, I know the women really enjoy these little details, but my father's mother-in-law was younger than me. And when he married this young lady, he had a brother-in-law. He was 72. He had a brother-in-law that was 11. <laughs> and when we went to the wedding, yeah, I tell you, it was something. They had the John Deering Mansion on Biscayne Bay, and, and they had the gondola boats coming by and helicopters flying all over and everyone coming with limousines for this wedding. And, and a friend of mine told one of our kids, Daniel, who was 13 at the time, he said, Daniel, when you get there, he says, I want you to climb up into Mary Ann's lap. That was her name. And say, Grandma, tell us about the good old days. 
He didn't do that. <laughs> but you know, he had all that money, but he just had so much stress. And Karen was, Karen's a PT, and she was giving Dad a back rub because he couldn't sleep. He slept with a gun under his pillow. Uh, just, you know, it's, you, you think, oh, I'd be happy if I had all that money and had all those toys, but uh, that world is a very difficult world. Um, here's a dad with John Paul II. He knew the presidents because he would donate to the different presidents, and, and you could visit the Pope too. If you donate $2 million, I can guarantee you, you can visit the Pope. <laughs> but um, Jesus said, one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. Lay up not on earth for yourself treasures where thieves break through and steal and rust and moth does corrupt. And my dad had all of, we had Lamborghinis in the parking lot and Rolls Royce and Corvettes and I actually borrowed my stepmother's Jaguar XKE and wrecked it once in reverse. But I parked it in the circular driveway and they never knew until I confessed when I became a Christian because they thought someone came in the driveway and hit it because I wrecked it in reverse, it looked like that. So we had all these toys and all this money, but they weren't happy. They were just miserable. Now I'm gonna switch over to mom a little bit. Uh, mom and dad were very different. My dad came up Baptist background, but he was pretty much an atheist. My mother was raised Jewish, uh, but she was pretty much an atheist. And um, she was very talented. She started writing songs in her teens for Elvis Presley. And she took me a couple times to uh, meet him at events. And um, she was an actress, but her acting was mostly small parts. And she had a couple parts in movies with Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner, The Buccaneer and Ten Commandments and, and other you know, B-rated movies that you probably never heard of. She wrote a lot of songs for um, everyone from Frank Sinatra to uh, Andy Williams and uh, Frankie Avalon and uh, a lot of the standards. Some of you don't even know who I'm talking about right now. But her real, her real uh, peak of influence was when she became the president of the film critics in uh, Beverly Hills and she was the film critic for Good Morning America and she knew everybody in Hollywood and it was a very powerful position. And uh, they were giving her free tickets to restaurants, free cruises and vacations because they all wanted her to give good ratings on their movies and, and good ratings on their, their restaurants. And, and uh, I, I tell people this story and they, they sometimes don't think it's true. So I throw in some pictures that I got from moms and just to show that uh, here's mom with Dustin Hoffman. He didn't look very happy. Sylvester Stallone, uh, George Burns, if anyone remembers who he was, uh, Paul McCartney, or Sir Paul McCartney, uh, Jimmy Stewart, Warren Beatty. These are all black and white just because I got these all from one mural that mom had and she just had them all converted to black and white. Bob Hope, uh, Natalie Wood, someone said they looked a little alike. Uh, Clint Eastwood, he's still out working today. Uh, Sally Field, uh, Paul Newman, and uh, Roger Moore, one of the James Bonds. And I don't know if you can see this. This is, I threw in a couple of color pictures. This is Rowan and Martin. I was there when this picture was taken. This was a TV special. Mom wrote a musical for television that had just, it had Nancy Sinatra, Frankie Avalon, Rowan and Martin, the Three Stooges were in it. So I got to meet them. And uh, this was, of course, they were 70 years old then. Curly had died, so they had a replacement Curly, but there's Mo and Larry, very funny guys. They're always playing checkers between takes. But when mom died, she knew all those people. Uh, she was alone. You know, it's a very cutthroat business in Hollywood. And um, it was just Karen and I were in the hospital room with my grandparents, and, and uh, nobody really cared. Everybody was clawing after everyone to get ahead. I knew kids, you know, some of these Academy Award winners, they were friends. We'd go to their house, they'd come to our house. And uh, I saw they were miserable. I had friends, I remember one friend, he was a famous child actor, locked himself in the garage, handsome, healthy, money, and for some reason locked himself in the garage, turned on the car and killed himself. And I thought, fame doesn't bring happiness. So many of them were on drugs and uh, their lives were so out of control. I thought, what's the purpose of life? And here's mom's obituary, the founder of the LA, that's what you get. You live your life, you get a little dash between two numbers and that's your life. I used to think, what is the purpose of life? 
So I was born in L.A., but mom moved to New York City, and, and I grew up mostly in Manhattan. And I lived two or three different places in New York City, and I went to 14 different schools growing up, um, partly because mom and dad divorced, and I got shipped back and forth between grandparents in Los Angeles and dad who moved to Florida, and mom in New York City, and then mom went to London. And, and so I was bouncing all over the place, and part of it is because I got into trouble and she kept moving me from school to school. And my mother and father were driven, and so my brother and I were always felt like we were in the way. Um, they kept sending us off to camp. Summertime, get them out of here. We went off to summer camp. Or it was boarding schools. My first boarding school, I was five years old. Black Fox Military Academy in Southern California. Can you imagine that? Sending a five-year-old to a boarding school. And then I went, I went to Jewish schools, public schools, Catholic schools, two different Catholic schools, two military schools. This is New York Military Academy, which is where Donald Trump went. That's not a political statement, I'm just telling you. Forget I said that. <laughs> but um, it was interesting because I went to this school, which was, it's the strictest, our teachers were retired military personnel. It was the strictest school in North America. And... Uh, uh, just a little footnote, that was my friend Bobby, who I knew since I was a kid in California, and he ended up becoming President Reagan's secretary when he was a governor, and he was with the president when he was shot, Reagan, when he was shot outside the car. And I'm still friends with Bobby today. But, um, you know, I went to all these schools, and I, I had no purpose. I was so unhappy. I thought, what's the purpose of life? You die? You live a little while, you, you turn into fertilizer, and if most people aren't happy, why not kill yourself? Just get it over with. Money doesn't bring happiness. Fame and good looks and fortune doesn't bring happiness. Life seems so empty and purposeless. I used to think about suicide. I remember at seven years old, I was always wondering what would be the best way to kill yourself. That's so sad. And I know in New York City, I'd go out to the roof. They didn't lock the roof access back then. And, you could go right out on the roof and I'd stand with my toes over the edge and I used to play a game where I'd see how far out I could lean. I wasn't afraid of heights before I felt my center of gravity. And uh, the only reason I didn't jump is because I remember reading in the paper about someone in New York that committed suicide. They tried by jumping, but they ended up hitting one of the trees that was there lining the street and then a car and they lived through it and they were all crippled up and they were worse than before. And I thought, what if I don't die? I was afraid I wasn't going to succeed. I read somewhere that a lot of people that attempt suicide don't succeed. And I thought, oh, that'd be terrible. How pathetic. And then I started thinking, um, I'm just going to take pills and go to sleep. Um, I knew mom took sleeping pills every night. And one day when she was out at a party, my brother was now living with my father in Miami for his cystic fibrosis. He needed the, the warmer climate down there. I was alone with mom. She was always out at functions and parties and, and I kind of got myself up and went to school on my own. I was in trouble all the time. I was just miserable. And I decided, I said, I want to go to sleep and never wake up. And I went into mom's bedroom. I knew she took sleeping pills and I rifled through her medicine chest and I found a bottle of pills. It said, take one at bedtime. I said, this is it, Eureka. And I filled my hands with the pills and I just got ready to take them and I saw a bunch of other bottles in her cabinet. And there were some there that were clearly pills for ladies. And I looked again at the bottle, and the bottle did not say sleeping pills. It said Valium, take one at bedtime. I thought, Valium? I didn't know. I was 13. I wasn't sure what Valium was. I thought, that could sound like a lady's medication. I said, if I take a handful of that, who knows what could happen? <laughs> and so I really got scared that I wasn't going to die again. <laughs> so I, I put them all back, and I waited. And somewhere along the way, I remember... Uh, I, read a, I watched a commercial they had for Schlitz beer that was on TV, and it said, you only go around once in life, get all the gusto you can. And I thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm alive, may as well do as many exciting things as I can, get all the gusto I can. Why die by doing something boring, like jumping off a building or going to sleep? Why not just seize the day? And I said, I'm just going to try and live as wild and exciting a life as I could, and, and I really did. Well. It's interesting that um, about that same time, I told mom I didn't want to go back to military school because today, New York Military Academy has boys and girls. Back then, it was only boys. And now I'm 13. I, I, I wanted girls around. 
and I got in trouble. I got thrown in jail that summer. My mother told my father, Doug needs more freedom. They were so opposite. Dad, military school. Mom, he needs to express himself. And so she said, I found a school. It's just what Doug needs. He's so talented. It's called Pine Hinge. It's an experimental school. Well, this school, you didn't have to go to class if you didn't want to. You didn't have to wake up if you didn't want to. Um, they figured kids will learn when they want to learn what they learn. And uh, I'll tell you, the whole year was a party. They had three real rules at the school. They said there's no drugs, no fighting, no sex. Nobody paid attention to the three rules that they had. It was the most bizarre, wild, uh, incoherent party. I don't remember ever sitting in a class that whole year. The school, the experiment failed. It closed after my year there. But I was getting into more and more trouble. And mom and dad didn't really help. You see, uh, I remember one time when mom sat down with me and she said, look, Doug, I know you're going to run into drugs out on the street. I'll feel better if you do it here at home. And I was 13 years old. Mom lit up a joint and smoked pot with me. Mom and dad smoked cigarettes and drank. We, we had alcohol with our meals and she would let my brother and I drink wine, even as kids. And I started drinking early because my dad always used to leave his martinis laying around and I liked the olives he left in his martinis. He wouldn't, and I would go around saying, I have the olive. Well, you know, I started liking whatever that olive was fermented in. <laughs> and I started draining his glasses and I developed a taste for alcohol when I was living with dad as a kid. And um, I started being a regular pattern. I'd smoke pot with mom two or three times a week and we'd eat ice cream and watch TV. My brother would come visit from Florida. He'd say, that's not fair. I can't smoke because cystic fibrosis is a lung disease. And, and my mother said, well, don't worry. I'm going to make you some cookies. And I know they're legal now, but my mom was making cannabis cookies a long time ago. <laughs> and she would make either hashish brownies or cannabis cookies for Falcon and, uh, and me. And I remember one time I took some to school and I gave them to a teacher. <laughs> I said, my mom made some extra brownies. I wanted to know if you wanted some. I didn't tell mom that I did that. I just wondered what will happen. Teacher was pretty happy the next day. <laughs> so I was getting in a lot of trouble. And when I would go down and I was living with dad, you know, in the summer we'd spend with dad or vacations we'd stay with dad. And, he lived on this island. We had a butler and a maid, and, and um, you know, we could go water skiing right out the back of the house, and he had a yacht. We had a ski boat and a sailboat, and, and uh, I'd hang out with my friends, and we just got so bored. Now, here's all these millionaire kids, and we were just bored stiff in the summertime. And so we started, for excitement, we started breaking into each other's houses and stealing. And, uh, I mean, it wasn't quite like we'd say, well, we broke into my house this week, let's break into your house. We were breaking into the houses of the other millionaires. And just, we didn't need it. We had money. It was just, we were bored. We had no purpose in life for the excitement, and we were all using, all those kids were using drugs back then, most of them anyway. And, uh, and there was a security guard that guarded the only bridge onto the island, and they were trying to figure out how these thieves that were, it didn't matter what we stole. My friends would say, Doug, I dare you to break into that house. And I'd break into the house. And I'd come out and I'd have a tennis racket. I mean, we'd just steal anything. Just, or um, started stealing, you know, stereos and bicycles and just whatever we could. And, and uh, the security was trying to figure out what's going on. And so they finally hired police in boats to patrol the island because they were sure the thieves were coming by boat and all the kids would sit there and watch these police circle the island we'd laugh because it was the kids of the millionaires that were breaking into each other's homes but I wanted so much my friends to like me because my parents were so driven I just felt like I had no attention at home and um, I'd do whatever they dared me to do I was just as crazy as I could be and I was breaking into homes and doing burglary and stealing and using drugs and when I was in Florida I'd invite my friends over during the day to drink my dad had a bar in the house, better than some bars you'd find downtown. And I'd drink all I wanted, and the butler kept resupplying the bar, thinking my father was drinking it. And we knew what his schedule was, and dad never knew. And uh, I should just pause here and mention, you know, I've, I've used a lot of different drugs. Uh, praise the Lord, I never used heroin, but I had used cocaine and speed and ups and downs and alcohol. More of my friends died from alcohol than all the other drugs put together. I'm not justifying any drugs. 
The reason I mention that is I meet Christians that think it's okay to drink a little alcohol, and that really concerns me because it is one of the most destructive uh, drugs out there. Anyway, well, I started running away from home. First time I ran away from home, I was 13. I always felt I wanted to get out in the country. When I went to summer camp, it was so amazing to me. But in the city, New York City, I, I, I was very unhappy. And so um, 13 years old, I ran away from home, got arrested. Mom said, I can't handle them anymore. She sent me down to my father. I got arrested. My father, my stepmother said, I can't handle them anymore. My father had me living in his hotel. My dad owned a hotel in Miami. And so I'm living in his hotel, working at the hotel, because he doesn't know what to do with me. I ran away again, got arrested. I was like in and out of jail seven times uh, before I was 16. He said, Doug, I don't know what to do with you. He said, you're on your own. He said, I, I can't handle it anymore. And I said, amen. I said, I, I can't handle it either. And um, I couldn't wait to get out and just, I'm sure I had all the answers. So I was like 15, 16 years of age. I ran away. I just went hitchhiking. And I took off from Miami. Miami. I ended up in Boston. And um, I kind of knew the roads because I used to take the bus and the planes back and forth between Miami and New York. I went to school and camp in Maine. And um, I settled in Boston and I started just living like a thief. I was breaking into homes. I was stealing. I was stealing cars, stealing televisions. On the side, I had a job as a security guard. <laughs> I was 16 years old, but I had a driver's license that said I was older because I had taken my learner's permit where it said 1957. Now you know my date. And I turned the seven into a two, and I used that to get an authentic driver's license. And so here I've got a job as a security guard. They think I'm an adult. I'm 16 years old. I'm walking around Boston like a big shot with a weapon. Got my own apartment. And uh, I had a friend who was a security guard, and he knew I was stealing. He said, Doug, your karma's going to get you. I thought he was going to turn me in. I never stole from the places I guarded because they trusted me. I'd guard places at night and then I'd steal during the day. Because if you walk out of an apartment during the night with a TV, you look suspicious. If you carry that TV out in broad daylight, they think you're moving. <laughs> and so he found out what I was doing. I said, are you going to turn me in? I don't want to lose my job. The stealing part, you never knew how much money you were going to get. And he said, uh, no, your karma is going to get you. I said, what do you mean? I was a little scared, but I was intrigued. He said, everything you do, God sees it and you're going to get paid back for it. You do bad, it comes back. You do good, it comes back. I said, oh man, there's no God. I, said, I stole that TV, I stole that car, nothing happened to me, nothing's going to happen. He said, you'll see. And a few days after that conversation, I woke up in my apartment in Boston and I wondered why my door was halfway open and I looked, my TV was gone. <laughs> and my radio. And I was really mad, I called the police too. I wanted them to track down those thieves. <laughs> I thought, what's the world coming to? <laughs> I really did. I was upset. I reported it. And then I started watching, and everything I did seemed to backfire. I would, uh, I'd steal a car and uh, took it to New York City to try and sell it. It got a flat tire, but I was not a very good car thief. I couldn't get in the trunk to change the tire. Had to hitchhike back to Boston in the rain, and it was just miserable. Or I'd steal something while I was drinking, and I'd hide it, and then I woke up and I knew I stole it, but I couldn't remember where I hid it. <laughs> or I'd risk my life and steal something, and then I'd get back and find out I'd stolen a broken stereo. It didn't even work. And then I was mad. I said, why would someone keep a broken stereo? <laughs> and, um, or I'd steal something, and my friends were thieves. They'd steal it from me. And I started thinking, this is, it's not going well. And what finally convinced me there was a God was really a small thing. I started watching I said, this, maybe this karma thing's real. And I went to someone's house and I stole a box of Krusty's Instant Pancake Mix. I did it because it was the whole wheat variety. It was a brand new box. And even though I was drinking and smoking cigarettes and using drugs and everything, I, I was a hippie. I wanted whole wheat pancake mix so I could be healthy. <laughs> I still laugh at that. And, um, but I remember I stole it. And this is before they had the barcode. On top of the box, it was stamped $1.19. I went back to my home, and that very day, some friends came through. I had a brand new jar of Tang Instant Breakfast Drink. They drank the whole thing, and there by the empty jar was the lid on the table, 
And I looked, it said $1.19. And I looked at the pancake mix, I said, ooh, that's weird. <laughs> I said, there must be a God. And it just struck me. I was thunderstruck. I said, there must be a God. This couldn't be an accident. And then I thought, maybe there's a heaven. And maybe there's the other place. And I knew where I was going. And I thought, I better find out more about this. Now, I wasn't interested in Christianity because for me, I thought Christians are all hypocrites. So I went on this search and I was trying to figure out what was the true religion. Well, back then, you know, the Beatles, everyone was into these Eastern religions. And so I said, Christians, they're all hypocrites. I made the mistake a lot of people make. When you want to know what a Christian is, you look at Christians. And I was less than impressed. And I'd turn on the news and say, yeah, Protestants in Ireland are blowing up the Catholics and the Catholics are killing the Protestants. They all say they're Christians. Jesus said, love your enemies. They're killing each other. I said, oh, they're all hypocrites. Don't judge Christianity by Christians. You want to judge Christianity by Christ. He will never let you down. So I started going into all the Eastern religions and I got into transcendental meditation and yoga and Buddhism and silver mind control and, and I was doing everything I could looking for God. I already knew a little about Judaism. My mother had sent me to the temple and I got into yoga. That's where, you know, you do all these concoctions and contorted exercises trying to find God and you stand on your head and all I found was my hair fell out when I did that. <laughs> and I went to, I was hitchhiking around, 16 years old, I was hitchhiking around Southern California, Santa Monica. And uh, they said at the, um, at the Christian mission, if you went there, they would give you free food, but you had to listen to the service. So I said, free food, that's all right. So a buddy and I, we went to the Christian service and we sat there and you had to listen to some guy share his testimony and preach. And I thought, you know, I was kind of touched by his testimony, but I thought, what, what's he talking about? Born again, sanctified. It was like another language for me. I didn't know what they, he meant. And I felt so embarrassed because I'm sitting there with all these, these drunks and druggies and with my friend, and they're all being so disrespectful and they're burping and they're sick. And, and these people were so nice and they brought out this nice food. It was stew with bread and cherry pie. I never forgot that. It was good food. And then a few days later, someone said, yeah, you can get some free food if you go to the Hare Krishna mission. I said, let's try it out. I said, that's far out. Hare Krishna. They believe in reincarnation. That's what I want. So I went with my friend from New York, Jay. He was from Brooklyn, New York. And um, we went inside, and they had drums going. They had the electric guitar, and everybody's wearing kind of their saffron pajamas, it looked like. And, uh, and they were jumping up and down. And they're playing the drums and electric guitars and they just kept saying, I don't want to be disrespectful, this is just what I saw. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I never forgot it because they did it for two hours. <laughs> and halfway through it, I'm going, oh man, I just I said, excuse me, I just went out and I went to the restroom and I just kind of wait and so I get the food. <laughs> when I thought they were winding down, I went back in, my friend Jay was getting into it. And I'm going, hey man, knock it off. This is hypnosis. <laughs> and then they just gave us yogurt and raisins for all of that. I said, well, I'm not joining this church. <laughs> so, I mean, but I was searching. I was open. And I was, you know, I got into Hinduism and we were meditating. And I even took a course in silver mind control. And, and uh, I'd already been, like I said, you know, I knew something about Judaism and Catholicism. And about this time, I went back to Boston and my father came up to visit me and uh, he said, Doug, you're wasting your life. I felt like such a big shot. I said, Dad, I'm on my own. I'm 16 and I'm on my own. I said, look, I got a wad of money. I said, let me buy your dinner. And he said, Doug, I'm not impressed. I have a million dollars in the briefcase. That's what he told me. <laughs> he was also there for a business deal. And um, he says, you're wasting your life. My brother was sick. And he said, you know, I've got this business I built up. And he said, you're healthy. He said, you've got to get an education. You're wasting your life. He said, I found a school. I said, I'm not going back to military school. He said, There's, it's on a boat. It's great. It sails around the world. It's actually two boats. It was called the Flint School Abroad. There were two schools like this back then. One of them they made a movie about called White Squall. There was Jeff, Jeff Bridges, and that, that one sank. This school was not the one that sank. <laughs> and so this was called the Flint School. And he said, there's girls, you'll get to go diving, and you'll have all this fun. I said, all right, you know, I was getting kind of tired of living on the streets, and he seemed so desperate. 
He dropped everything. He somehow got me a passport in 24 hours. And uh, he flew me from Boston to Genoa, Italy. We went and met the boat. And uh, he handed them my passport and, and they welcomed me to the school. School had already begun. And I found out that I'd sort of been tricked because this was not just a fun and loving school. This was a kind of exclusive school for the kids of politicians and millionaires from around the world that had gotten in trouble with drugs or they had gotten into cults to separate them from their environment and get them straightened out. And they have an intense program of teaching atheism. They were showing us films on Darwin, saying there is no God, and making us read books by Ayn Rand and saying you got to make yourself. And, and I thought, wow, this is so different. Now that this is where I was, and I, I'm not there anymore. And I kind of rebelled a little bit. I mean, it was, it was neat living on the boat, and, um, but it was very regimented. And I kind of rebelled at, at uh, first. I, I didn't participate in class because, you know, I'd been on my own. Now I feel like I'm a kid again. I'd been an adult, and now back in school, and they're telling me what to do, and my grades just went in the tank, and I was not participating. And, and uh, the captain, he talked to me. He said, Doug, what do we have to do to get you to participate? At first, they said, you know, if you don't participate, um, you have to sit on the floor. So I'd sit on the floor. I'd clown around. It was still disrupting things, and the school's on the boat, and you'd sail around. You're having classes while you're sailing, or you're working the ship. And then they said, or you don't get your food. My friends, my roommates would smuggle me food. And they said, this is just wrecking morale. I said, Doug, you're wrecking the morale of the whole program. What do we got to do to get you to participate? I said, you let me go home for Christmas break, and I'll, I'll work with the program. <laughs> he went, we were in uh, Tunis, Africa, and he went right to the telephone. He made an international call, said, Mr. Bachelor, woke up my father. He says, we got good news. Doug is showing remarkable progress. We think he'll be ready to come home because you couldn't even go home Christmas unless you had been a really good student. They wanted to get rid of me. He said, we, we think he's ready to come home. My dad was so happy. So I behaved for the next few weeks, but I learned an interesting lesson. From, uh, we were sailing from northern Africa back across the Mediterranean to Spain. I know on the map, Mediterranean looks small, but you get out in the middle of it, and it looks pretty big. In wintertime, they have some tremendous storms. You can read about this in the last chapters of Acts. Paul got into one of those storms where they had saw neither sun or moon for 14 days. They, all hope of being saved was gone. This was a serious storm that caught us back then. And the boat we were on was an iron ship. Uh, I was on one, the other one was following. And sailboat, big mast, and um, the waves were coming over the front of the boat. It was winter. The water was very cold. Everyone was seasick. The wind was howling so hard that when you were up on deck, you could yell at the person five feet away. They couldn't hear you. The mainsail ripped. Everybody was seasick, including the captain. The captain notified everybody, if you fall overboard, he says, be very careful. If you fall overboard, we cannot turn around to get you in this weather. We'll mark the spot and tell your parents. What do you think atheists do when they think they're going to die? It was the most amazing thing, the transformation that came over that whole school. How all of a sudden everybody became very religious. And people were praying and they were making, people know what to confess too. When they think they're going to die, they're ready to confess it. Making promises to God and of course we survived. And that taught me fear is a bad reason to turn to God. It might be a starting point, but you don't want to serve God just because you're afraid of of the lake of fire. You need to serve God because you love him. I was making promises and prayers and nobody was going Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. They were all talking to the Lord. <laughs> so we got to Porto Home, Spain. They took me to the airport and the other students that were allowed to go home got on the airplane with me back to the States. I said, uh, I bought a pack of cigarettes and I bought a beer. They said, Doug, you're going to be in, you could smoke and drink on the planes back then. They said, you're going to be in big trouble. I said, you will never see me again. I got home. Dad took the family snow skiing up in Canada and enjoyed vacation. When it came time to go back to school, my brother wondered why I was selling everything I had to him. <laughs> and he was always anxious to make a deal. And uh, I got as much money as I could. I took off hitchhiking. Oh, I left out the pictures of the storm. This is actually off the website 
of the Flint School Abroad. That is actually the two boats. And one of our graphic designers put it out in the storm. That was nice. I missed that good picture. So I got out on the highway and I started hitchhiking. And I'd done a lot of that. And I was going from Miami, Florida. I wanted to go to California. I'd found some caves up in the mountain when I was 16 years old in Santa Monica, hitchhiking around and they were above Palm Springs. I thought, I, I'm going to go out there and live in the mountains. But this is now winter time because I just left during Christmas break. It's like New Year's and I'm hitchhiking across country. I wasn't very smart. I'm wearing like a thin Florida windbreaker. I get stuck in Oklahoma. It's freezing weather below zero and I am freezing to death. I'm on Interstate 40 by myself. I lost all my money drinking and playing pool the day before. I was very religious now, but I was making dumb bets. And um, I knew there was a God, but I stood there for hours. And I got so desperate at times, I would beg when the cars went by. I remember getting on my knees as the cars went by. And I, I felt so discouraged because I'd see big old cars with a heater on going my way, one person in this big old Cadillac, and, and they didn't care about me. I'm dying out on the road. And I made a foolish vow back then. I said, Lord, if I ever get a car, I'm going to pick up every hitchhiker that I see. I hope the Lord's forgiven me since then. But uh, anyway, so uh, I prayed. And I prayed a very specific prayer. I said, Lord, I need some help. I know I'm a terrible person. And I really was pretty rotten. Uh, I had a friend that got a brand new bicycle for his birthday. I broke into his house, his garage, stole, he had a really nice bike, I stole his 10-speed bike, I sold it to another friend who then went to great lengths to change the serial number because he knew it was a hot bike. He painted it. I then stole it from him. I sold it to someone else. And I didn't care about anybody. You know why? I didn't know there was anyone who cared about me. I'd come from this mindset, it's survival of the fittest. And so when I was out on the highway, I said, Lord, I'm a terrible person. I was not exaggerating. I said, will you please forgive me? Will you please help me? And I asked God for four things. I said, please help me get a ride to where I'm going, 1,500 miles away in California. I said, help me get some food. I was hungry. I said, help me get some money. I was broke. And then the fourth thing, I prayed, Lord, give me a ride with someone normal. Because they, there's a saying among hitchhikers, the only people that pick you up are Christians and crazy people. And I got picked up by some strange, I got picked up by this one guy who was drinking. And he said, watch this. He was on Highway 1. You know Highway 1 in California? Watch this. I can drive with my lights off at night. And it scared me half to death. I got picked up, Buddy and I got picked up by these college students that were smoking so much pot in their car they could not see out the windshield. They went across the interstate into oncoming traffic. So you think it's dangerous to pick up hitchhikers. It's dangerous to get picked up. <laughs> and so I said, Lord, Give me a ride with somebody normal. Right after I prayed, I'd been there eight hours, the next vehicle stopped. It was white van. The guy picked me up. He took me all the way to California to the door of where I was going. He fed me all the way there. I didn't ask him to. Every time we stopped, he'd feed me. He gave me $40 when he dropped me off. I didn't ask for it. I also did not ask for him to preach to me all the way from Oklahoma <laughs> to California. He was a new Christian. He was a born-again Christian. He was telling everybody along the way about Jesus. He was totally bold. This was the day of the Jesus movement. That's what they call Jesus freaks. And all these young people were just totally bold for Christ. And, and I had to listen to him as he drove along. You know, he's talking to me about the Bible. I thought, I've got to listen to this or jump out of the car. And I didn't want to get back out. It was cold out there. And he was pretty nice. I just thought he was kooky. But, you know, I did find that as a good way to witness. I pick up hitchhikers. And I wait until I'm going about 65 and I make my gospel presentation. And then I turn and look at him and I accelerate. Would you like to accept Jesus? <laughs> I do. I pick up people I witness. I don't scare them to death, though. And, um, but I said, you know, Bible's a fairy tale. So he dropped me off. And now I was going to find God through nature. So I moved up into the mountains, these caves I had found when I was 15 up above Palm Springs, California, a mountain called Takwitz Canyon. And uh, I lived, it was, the mountain is 11,000 feet high. You may not know, there's a pretty tall mountain down there. And uh, halfway up, 
It's very rugged, rough desert mountains. As a matter of fact, National Geographic has some programs about some people that got lost and died up there and rescues up there. It's, it's a very treacherous area. And I found a cave up there. And it was a beautiful spot. This is a view from above Palm Springs. This is before you head down the other side to where the canyon is. And there's all these cliffs you cannot get around. You can't hike down the mountain. It's, uh, Mount San Jacinto down there. And at the base of that mountain, there was a creek. And there, was, there are several caves up there, but there is a large cave right by a waterfall. I lived there for about a year and a half. And I was a hermit. And I was trying to find God through nature. And I wore no clothes. And uh, I thought it was biblical, actually, you know, Adam and Eve. And um, I wasn't the only one back then <laughs> that was doing that. That was the age of the flower children. And uh, I would hike down to Palm Springs once or twice a week. And I would get my groceries. And I would panhandle. I'd play the guitar, the flute, and beg for money. And uh, sometimes I'd do what they call dumpster diving. I went in the dumpster and... I should pause here and mention that uh, my grandfather and my grandmother lived in Desert Hot Springs. I had gotten arrested at one point <laughs> for indecent exposure. I got arrested. I was in the Palm Springs jail. My grandfather found out that I had been getting food out of the garbage can. And when my father found out, so he worked all his life through the Depression so his kids would never have to struggle like his mother and brothers did. And he found out that I was getting food out of the garbage can. It broke his heart. I never realized how much it hurt him until later. And I think, I wonder how much it hurts our Heavenly Father when his children go to the garbage of the world looking for happiness instead of accepting his son. So the miracle is when I moved into this cave, well, that's a picture of my cat, Stranger. I call him Stranger because he just showed up one day way up there in the mountains and he lived with me for a year and a half. It's kind of neat because he kept the mouse population down in the cave. He did steal my steak once while I was cooking it and that really made me mad. But um, he would uh, he'd keep the mice down at night in the wintertime. He'd push on my face after he was done hunting while I was sleeping in my sleeping bag. And I'd open up my sleeping bag. He'd crawl down to the very bottom and he'd sit at my feet and purr. I don't know how he stood the smell down there, but that's what he'd do. <laughs> so I had my cat, Stranger. Uh, years later, I went up with our son, Micah, to the cave. And there's, this is a picture of the pool waterfall that was just outside. It was a, a beautiful spot, like a little oasis up in these very hot desert mountains. It was very hard to get to. And um, the miracle is, while I was living up there, somebody at some point had left a Bible in the cave. Now, when I found the cave, it had not been, it was not totally clean. People had camped there before. There was campfire stones, and there's black on the ceiling, and there's some pots and pans that had been left, and uh, some other debris that campers had left, and there was a Bible that someone had left there. And I didn't think anything of it. I mean, there was some junk in the cave and there was a Bible along with the junk. But after living there for a while, I was running into Christians in town. And these Jesus freaks. I'd say, are you born again? Are you sanctified? And they'd be asking me questions about, you washed in the blood? And I'm like, mean, what are you talking? And I felt ignorant. And so I thought, I'm going to read the Bible so I can argue with them because I was all into reincarnation back then. Now I was into the American Indian religions. I wanted to be at one. For years, my dad told us we were all part Cherokee, and I told everyone that growing up, and I wanted to be at one with my Indian roots, and then my kids bought me a DNA test, and I found out I have no American Indian in me at all. <laughs> I'm actually part Indian from India. <laughs> but I was trying to be at one with the Indian religions. I was taking peyote and hallucinogenics. But I thought, I've got to read the Bible so I can argue with these Christians. And, you know, I, I started reading through Genesis. I thought, oh, this is fascinating. I got bogged down in Exodus. And one of my Christian friends said, Doug, you jump to the New Testament. Start with the New Testament. Matthew, Mark. I said, okay. So I went to the New Testament. And every morning, I'd eat banana bread. I used to make banana bread from day-old bananas that I would get at the store. And I would, um, I'd read the Bible. And as I was reading the Bible, I'm going, wow. I've been hearing these quotes all my life. I didn't know they came from the Bible. Going the second mile, the skin of your teeth, at your wit's end, handwriting on the wall, turning the other cheek. I'm going, oh, that's in the Bible. Oh, that's in the Bible. <laughs> I thought, there's a lot of wisdom in here. I've been quoting this all my life. And then I read about Jesus. And I was really shook because I thought he was just one of the 
one of the Maharajis, one of the spiritual enlightened ones. I had no idea. Christ, I thought, he's either a liar because he says, I am the only way. He didn't say, I'm one of many. He said, I am it. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. He said that he was God, God's son. And I ended up grappling with the same struggle. If you read C.S. Lewis, he said, I had to make up my mind whether Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. He says, those are your only options. And I said, well, I don't think he was a liar because everything I read just resonated with truth. I was so amazed at how profound the teachings of Jesus were. So much better than all the Eastern books I'd read. They were nothing compared to Jesus. People who heard him talk say, never man spoke like this man. I knew he wasn't crazy because what he said was so brilliant. He died in defense of truth. He could have def- lied to save his life, but because truth was so important, he was willing to die for what he believed. I, I knew he wasn't crazy, which means he wasn't a lunatic. He, he wasn't a liar, which means the only other option is he was Lord. And that really shook my world. And I thought, you know, what have I got to lose? I was prejudiced against Christians because my mother, growing up with a Jewish background, she said, Christians are the ones who persecuted and the, and the Nazis claimed to be Christians and here they killed all the Jews and I had a real barrier against Christianity. But I thought, you know, I've tried everything else. Maybe I was taught wrong. Maybe these people killing each other in the name of Christ aren't really Christians. So I got on my knees up in the mountain and I prayed a very primitive prayer And um, it's interesting, I should mention, that Bible I started reading, there was a prayer written in the front of the Bible. And I didn't pay much attention to it, but it said someone's name I don't remember. They said, born again on such and such a date, I hope whoever finds this book finds the peace and joy I found. Something like that was written in the front of the Bible. And I thought, well, that's cute. I'm sorry that that Bible years later, it fell in the creek and it got swollen up and I lost it. I wish I knew the name of that person because God answered their prayer. I got on my knees in the cave and I said, Lord, I'm a big zero. I am running around naked up in the mountains, eating out of garbage cans, using drugs, stealing, lying, drinking, living immorally. And I said, uh, and I'm not happy. I said, if Jesus is real, will you forgive my sins? Give me some purpose for living. Come into my heart. And you know, I just felt everything change that day. I wish I had noted the date, but I did not have a calendar in the cave, so I don't know what day it was. But I was 17 years old, and I felt this peace. And not everything changed all at once. In fact, the first few Bible studies I gave, I didn't have any clothes on. Hikers came by. But I was so excited about Jesus. Little by little, the Lord started changing my heart and transforming me. And I remember being up there in the cave and saying, Lord, I know you don't want me to live like this forever. I felt this desire to tell everybody. See, I was in the cave because I wanted to get away from everyone. I hated people. I couldn't get along with people. I said, I just, people cause problems. I just want to be by myself. And now I had this burning desire to tell everybody. My whole heart changed. I said, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to tell everybody, but I said, if you want me to tell other people about you, you're going to have to do something to let me know because I know I can't do much up here in the cave. I went to town a few days after praying that prayer. I called my mom in Beverly Hills. I used to check in with her. She said, just call me. Let me know you're alive. And I called. She said, oh, Doug, I'm so glad you called. Are you going to be up at the cave in the next few days? I said, yeah. She said, I want to come up with a film crew. I said, what? She said, yeah, I was telling somebody from NBC. I said, yeah, my, my son, his dad's a millionaire, and he's living in a cave. And she said, that's a great human interest story. You think he'd let us interview him? She said, well, you'll have a hard time getting there. He's way up in these rugged mountains. Oh, we'll rent a helicopter. (laughs) And so that's actually happened to me twice. Years later, National Geographic paid to fly me back up to the cave again. (laughs) So I've had two trips from media up to visit the cave. So all of a sudden, NBC flies up with a film crew. This is actually a picture. They took this picture of me. Otherwise, praise the Lord, that's the cover of the book. I'd never had that picture except NBC took it that day. And this is Bill Applegate. He flew my mother up to the cave. They did an interview. It was on national television three times that day. I know a friend in jail said I was watching on TV. It was on three times that day. And I was able to share my testimony. And I thought, here, I just prayed, Lord, do you want me to tell somebody? You'll have to show me. He sends a film crew to my cave. God is good, friends. 
I've been up there several times. A couple times I went up, I actually left a Bible, just in case. And you know, it was kind of interesting. This year, I was able to hike up with uh, our youngest son, Stephen, who's sitting there. He's been up there. He was pretty young then. Karen's been up there. This is, uh, the whole crew went up once, and you can see how small Stephen was at that time. And um, been back to visit. This year, there, some good things have come out of COVID. I was able to hike up to the cave for the first time with Nathan. And I'll tell you, friends, I'm getting old. I barely made it. <laughs> that may be my last trip up there without a helicopter. But I think about how God is blessed. You know, my mom, you can tell this is a picture of my brother's wedding. And uh, that's one of the few pictures I've got of my mom and dad together. And you can see I'm the black sheep there with the beard. Yes, I had hair at one point on the right. And they've all passed away. And um, I want to go back to the story that we started with in the Bible. Here Jesus met that demoniac self-destructive, running around naked, living in a cave, a tomb, surrounded by the dead and the pigs. He came to Jesus as he was. You know, friends, nobody is such a big sinner, you can't come to Christ. You're not a bigger sinner than that man or than me. He came to Christ. Jesus set him free. He clothed him. And then he said, go tell others what great things God has done for you. So I kind of relate to that guy. God opens the door for each one of us to come just the way they are, and he will accept us. You know, a few years ago, I got a call from my um, sister-in-law. She said, your brother's not doing very well. And um, Falcon struggled all his life. He started a camp for kids with cystic fibrosis in the Florida Keys, and I used to go be a camp pastor. And uh, I went to see him one time, and, and uh, not long before he died, he'd try and walk around the golf course. He'd stop and he'd cough catch his breath, and we'd walk and talk. He'd say, Doug, life is not fair. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm smart. He said, in fact, I'm brilliant, but I'm sick. He said, and you're healthy, but you're stupid. <laughs> See, my brother could have had, he had all the toys. He had the house in Miami Beach, and he had the car and the boat and everything, and, but he was dying. He said, I would give everything I've got, Doug, if I could have your lungs and live a little longer. And I thought here he was willing to give every earthly thing if he could have a little more of this life. And yet God gave his son so that you could have eternal life. I was thankful I was able to be at Falcon's bedside when, when he passed away and I said, Falcon, will you let me pray with you? And even though he used to always tease me about my religion, at the end, he said, will you please pray for me? And I prayed and asked Jesus to come into his heart and forgive his sins. And I hope to see him in the kingdom. And, you know, that's my greatest joy, is to be able to tell other people that this life, fame and fortune, money doesn't bring happiness. Happiness comes from having your sins forgiven and knowing that you will be with Christ through eternity and live in a world made new. You can get out of this world. Aren't you sick and tired of being sick and tired? This world has always been a pandemic, friends. This is nothing new. The disease of sin has always been here. Jesus is the only solution for that sickness. And before I close this segment with, with prayer, I'd just like to ask, if there are some here today, maybe God is speaking to your heart, and you've not made a decision to fully surrender your life to the Lord, or some of our friends who are watching the Revelation Now program, you can make that decision right now and give your heart to Jesus. Would you like to say yes to him? Can we all bow our heads for just a moment? If the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, and maybe you've become distracted with the things of this world, and you would like to say, Lord, I want to give Jesus first place in my heart. I want to live for him. Would you be willing to lift your hand in his presence and say, Lord, that's me. Father in heaven, you see these hands. I pray that you'll speak to each of their hearts and help know you will do for them what you did for this demoniac, what you did for me and so many others. You'll accept them just like they are, forgive their sins, and then transform them, Lord. Bless them with that experience and that peace right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, don't go away, friends. You're going to see Pastor Ross and I up on the screen in just a moment with Bible questions. I think Pastor Sean's going to come out and make some announcements. God bless you. And we'll be back...
throughout recorded history. Tales of ghosts and spirits can be found in folklore in nearly every country and culture. Egyptians built pyramids to help guide the spirits of their leaders. Rome sanctioned holidays to honor and appease the spirits of their dead. Even the Bible tells of a king that used a witch to contact the spirit of a deceased prophet. Today, ancient folklore of spirits and apparitions have gone from mere superstitions to mainstream entertainment and reality. Scientific organizations investigate stories of hauntings and sightings, trying to prove once and for all the existence of ghosts. Even with all the newfound technology and centuries of stories all over the world, there is still no clear-cut answer. So how do we know what's true? Why do these stories persist? Does it even matter? We invite you to look inside and find out for yourself. Visit deathtruth.com. Can't get enough amazing facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at aftv.org. At aftv.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit aftv.org. like to live my life over knowing what I know now. I don't want to start over and just make all the same mistakes. I want to have my memories so I don't make the same mistakes. But you do get a new beginning. You become a new creature. That feeling of all your sins being washed away because God promises it. Isn't that a wonderful concept, friends? I was thirsty. And you gave me drink. Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Hello, friends. We'd like to welcome you back to our Bible and Answer time here on uh, Revelation Now. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we're just moved from the sanctuary down to the studio, which is an amazing fact, and Pastor Doug and I it's might a be a little mile out of away. <laughs> <laughs> but we are delighted to be able to take your Bible questions, and as always, we look forward to this time. Um, Pastor Doug, are you ready? I think Caught so. your breath? I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to go ahead and take our first question for uh, today. We'll put that on the screen. It says, why does the Bible give such awful graphic descriptions of people's sins? Well, you know, that's one reason we know the Bible is true is because God does not gloss over the reality of what some of the struggles are that people have in Scripture. And so it gives a very real depiction. Uh, people understand that, um, you know, sin has caused a lot of evil in the world and what it does to us. If the Bible was a fairy tale or a fable, then it would, you know, maybe smooth things out. But the Bible is actually a very accurate history of the battle between good and evil. And so uh, I think it's because of the faithfulness of God's word mm -hmm. that it's doing that. And, you know, I know it, there are parts of the Bible you may not read to children when you're first teaching them the word of God. And then as they mature, you know, they'll be exposed to some of those 
difficult passages and there's some stories of war and intrigue that uh, are pretty graphic. Yes, so the Bible kind of, I think one of the positive things about the Bible describing some of those events is you can see how God changed real people mm -hmm. with real life issues, real struggles, and it gives hope to us. Yeah, where we can absolutely. see those uh, life-changing experiences. Our next question that we have, is all of the Bible inspired or just parts of the Bible? Well, you can read in 2 Timothy, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so the Lord has done something supernatural and miraculous in the way that he has preserved the contents of the Bible, the scriptures. And even in the choice of what books would be recognized as the sacred books of the Bible and others that might be, they might have value, but they're left out of the sacred canon. And the, of course, you know, in the New Testament, the books that we have now, were all recognized by the majority of the early church fathers. The apostles, of course, were the, the authors of those. The Old Testament is written by the prophets, kings, patriarchs that were inspired and filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, uh, the Bible tells us. So uh, we believe that if there is a communication from heaven to earth that is considered sacred and trustworthy and inspired, the Bible has passed that test. Absolutely. And you know, Pastor Doug, one of the things that uh, when the early church fathers organized the canon or the Bible, the New Testament in particular, one of the criteria that they were looking at is they wanted to make sure that the authorship of the various books were uh, proven. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also interesting to note that with the exception of Paul, all of the New Testament writers were eyewitnesses of the work of Christ. That's right. So, um, of course, Paul met Jesus uh, during his conversion but they were pretty uh, certain that these books were written by these individuals, no that doubt had, about yeah. it. And even Paul, though he was not a Christian during the time of Jesus, he was living during the time of Jesus, right. so he was aware with the reality of Christ's teachings and the time in which he lived. Okay, we have another question. It says, how do I convince a person who believes in evolution that the Bible is true? Well, no, we've got a lot of friends uh, in this society today that... Uh, evolution is their worldview how do you reach them well first of all you you can't convince in other words uh, uh, arguments not always the best way to do it uh, it's like mark twain said a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still uh, you can try and reason with them but at the heart of a lot of people that struggle with evolution once they acknowledge that there's a god then they acknowledge there's a purpose to life and then there's accountability for your life and fulfilling that purpose that makes some people nervous. If they can know that God is a loving God and the Bible is true, um, I would reason with them from the prophecies of the Bible. When you show that God was able to um, foretell the future so perfectly in the prophecies, it helps us recognize that God's over all time. Then they believe the other parts in the book about the dating methods. I personally think there's some good programs out there that that deal with the subject of evolution and explain creation as a more viable mm -hmm. uh, scheme. Of course, if you look in the Bible at some of the accounts given of history, for example, the flood, the flood story that we read about in Genesis answers so much of what we see in the natural world today. Yeah. You know, there's shells up a mile above sea level in Colorado in the mountains. Uh, how did the, the seashells get up there? So, you know, the flood does explain yeah. a lot of the things that we see in nature, mass burials of animals, the flood can help explain a lot of that. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's some scientific statements in the Bible. All right, we're going to go to some of the questions that have come in. And Pastor Doug, here's one. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is the verse. 2 Corinthians 3 and it's verse 3. Verse 3 and verse 7. And while you look that up, I'll read the question. Right. It says, um, I am new to keeping the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, but I've come across some confusing scriptures about the law. Can you please help me understand these scriptures? So 2 Corinthians yeah, 3 it. verse 3. Paul here, he says, uh, and I'll start with verse 2. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered to us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tables of the stone, but on the tablets of the heart, and uh, t uh, tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Well, that's not saying in, that the Ten Commandments is any way invalid. He's simply mm -hmm. saying that when we have the new covenant, the whole new covenant is in the heart. And so included 
in having that law written in our heart. It's all the law of God. But there's a spiritual side. Now let me see if I can explain it this way. For every aspect of the law, Jesus came to show that there is the spiritual aspect. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not kill. The spirit of the law, Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. If you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're guilty of murder. So it's not just an action, it's an attitude. The letter of the law says, do not commit adultery. Well, the spirit of the law says, do not be thinking it in your heart. Mm. It's an attitude. The Bible says, do not lie. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be honest in your communications. And in the same way, the letter of the law says, remember the Sabbath day. Well, also we should come to Jesus and have rest in our hearts. And so for every spiritual law, there is the literal foundation. And so the literal law is still there, but we want to be going, want to make sure not just be legalistic about keeping it, but keeping the spirit of the law as well as the letter. It reminds, it reminds me of the passage in Deuteronomy where God says to Moses, this is after the law was given, and the children of Israel said, everything that God has said we will do. And God said to Moses, oh, that there was a heart within them mm -hmm. that they would fear me and keep my commandments that I might be good for yeah. them. So God wants the commandments to be springing forth from love to him and love to our mm -hmm. fellow man, mm -hmm. which is the principles mm -hmm. upon which the law is written. Uh, Somebody is asking, Pastor Doug, how can we actually be holy? How can we be holy? Well, there's two ways that uh, we experience holiness. One is when we first come to Christ, uh, you can say that... Um, uh, we receive it through uh, justification. Mm -hmm. He declares us holy. When we repent of our sins, he will look upon us as though we have never sinned. But then as we continue to follow the Lord, it's not just a cover-up of our sin. Then he transforms us by something called sanctification. We learn through following him to live in a newness of life and uh, turning away from what is wrong and doing what is right. The word holiness means to be set aside. And when we accept Jesus, we trust that our lives are set aside for him. Right, right. And so uh, daily we're to just say, Lord, I, am, I belong to you. I'm set aside for you. It's like a husband and wife. Marriage is called holy matrimony. And uh, that couple might have some interesting discussions sometimes, but that doesn't mean it isn't holy matrimony anymore. They are set aside for each other. They've made that covenant. When we make that covenant, we are de determined and committed to serve the Lord uh, and turn from our sins. There's a holiness there. Okay. We have a couple that's asking, um, should we have a child right now, seeing that the world is in such a mess? That's a good question. You know, especially now with what's going on, it makes you think twice. I have far be it for me to ever tell a couple whether or not it's God's will for them to have children. Because uh, I know some pastors that did that 100 years ago, said the Lord's coming soon, don't, don't have children. children. And uh, <laughs> I, I, they obviously missed their opportunity. So uh, I'd really pray about that and make sure that you've got peace from the Lord. Jesus did say in the last days, woe to those that are nursing or with child in, mm -hmm. in the time when we have to flee for our lives. Don't know exactly what the date of that is going to be, but it is a difficult world right now to bring children into. Okay. Uh, someone else is asking, should Christians get involved in secret societies like Freemasons? No, because for Christianity, there's nothing secret about it. Mm -hmm. uh, someone said one time, uh, there's no such thing as a secret Christian. Either your Christianity will destroy the secrecy or your secrecy will destroy the Christianity. If you're a real Christian, you can't keep it secret. So as soon as someone belongs to a secret society, and there's probably a whole spectrum of them, what are you hiding? You know, Christians ought to be open and transparent about what they believe. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, going through these secret rituals and things, I think all are a little suspect. And some of them, I think they've got trappings in paganism and even... Um, diabolical worship. Mm -hmm. You've got to be careful of things that you've got to swear to secrecy in. You know, as yeah. Christians, uh, Jesus wasn't part of anything like that. Another question, is it good for Christians to meditate? Well, the word meditate is found many times in the Bible. Uh, you know, David in the Psalms talks about meditating on God's law. Mm -hmm. Now, for a Christian, meditation is very different from Eastern meditation. I used to be involved in Eastern meditation. The idea there is to sort of empty your mind you know you you say this mantra over and over again and uh, you, you keep repeating it and it, pretty soon it's like your mind is so full of nothingness because you're saying an empty word with no meaning attached that you become oblivious to your problems and you can create a sort of self-induced bliss it's not real but it's not expanding your mind you're basically emptying your mind 
and you get this sort of counterfeit peace. Real meditation is when you think about the majesty of God's word. Your mind is expanded. God says, come, let us reason together. So you're actually thinking cognitive things and you're reasoning about the wonders of God's word. That is meditating on the word of God, communing with Jesus. It's not the kind of Eastern meditation where you just empty your head and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. And you fill it with whatever comes away, yeah. comes along, so. All right, another question that we have. Um, this person is asking, where in the Bible, and probably they want to share it with somebody else, where in the Bible can I clearly see that Jesus is God? Oh, good. That's a great question. Uh, you know, it's a mystery for some folks. How could Jesus be a man and also be God? Well, for one thing, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. Mm -hmm. Well, you read in John chapter 1, it says, all things that were made were made by Christ. Mm -hmm. He is the Word. So Christ is God. The Bible says only God should be worshipped. It's in the Ten Commandments. When Jesus rose from the dead, he said, all hail. And Hebrews, you probably know the verse, it says even the angels worship him. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible says only God can forgive sin. And yet Jesus said he can forgive sin. And that's, by the way, Mark chapter 2, God and God only can forgive sin. The Bible tells us in uh, 1 Kings that only God knows the thoughts of men's hearts. Well, Jesus knew what was in man. John 2, Mark 2 also for that verse. Uh, Jesus knew man's heart. So you look at the different definitions of God, and Jesus fills all those definitions of and God. And even the Old Testament prophecies that point to the coming of the Messiah, that equate characteristics with Christ as being part of divinity. Yeah. Where he knows all, he's always been creator. So yeah. And the Jesus Bible's said, I am with you wherever you go. One yep. of the ways that we know God is he is all knowing. How could you know everybody and hear their prayers all at once unless you're omniscient? And how could you be with everybody all at once unless you're omnipresent through the yep. Spirit? Yeah. So Jesus meets all the criteria of what is God. I was thinking about something just this morning, uh, coming in this morning, about um, the trustworthiness of Christ in the Bible. You know, either you believe that he is the Son of God, or you believe that he's a master liar. You can't reach a conclusion from reading the Bible that Jesus was just a good man mm -hmm. who said certain things. Jesus claimed to be one with the Father. He yeah. said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So... You've got to accept what he says. He is God. He absolutely, is the Son of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Another question we have, where does God dwell? Well, we just talked about the omnipresence of God, but the Bible also seems to indicate even though God is a spirit, he also has a form of some form because there's a place the Bible describes as paradise, the dwelling place of God, when we pray. And Jesus said, Our Father, which art in heaven. So there is a place that is the capital of the cosmos, so we call it heaven or paradise, the dwelling place of God. Paul says, caught up to the third heaven. And uh, Isaiah in vision in chapter 6, he describes seeing God on his throne. You can read in the vision, and that's Isaiah 6, high and lifted up in heaven, in the temple. The earthly temple is built after the heavenly temple, and God sits enthroned in the holy of holies of the universe, which would be, don't get any holier than that. And uh, even in Daniel, it says, I saw the Son of Man brought before the Ancient of Days. So there's a place. Mm -hmm. God does seem to have a place where he can be known in time and space. But he's also, he can live outside time and space too. Okay. Uh, somebody else is asking, how do I know if I have truly forgiven someone? Well, you choose to. And you may remember the things they mm -hmm. do that bothered you. I remember hearing a story. Clara Barton was a good Christian. She had that famous nurse, and uh, someone had had an argument with her and said terrible things about her. And one of the friends, trying to stir up gossip, said, you remember what they said? And Claire Barton says, I clearly remember forgiving them for it. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you want to put it out of your mind. It may come back, but you, you choose to forgive. Mm -hmm. You treat them like you've forgiven. You don't bring it up again. Mm -hmm. It's like that person that forgives you and they keep reminding you. You wonder if they've forgiven you. Right. So we do the best we can do to humanly forgive and forget. We can't forget like God forgets our sins, but you don't dwell on it. Okay. Uh, somebody ask, else is asking, uh, can you explain a little more about faith without works? What does that mean? Well, there's some people that have a, it's sort of a, a shallow faith, and they say, well, all I'll need to do is come to Jesus and say, I believe that Jesus died for my sin but they don't want to believe in him, meaning they don't believe in him. Mm. Christ, when he said, if you believe in me, you show your faith by acting. 
Christ said, it's not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, that will be in the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of my Father. So if we believe what Jesus said, and he said, come to me, repent of your sins, follow my teaching, we say, I believe, and we go off and live the way that we used to live, that's a faith without works. You're, mm. you're not responding to your faith. You're not acting upon your faith by really coming and trusting him to transform you. Somebody else is wondering, uh, by acting uh, on my faith, in other words, doing those things God asks, by being obedient, does that build my faith? Yeah, actually, I think that when we take steps of faith, our faith grows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even obedience is an act of faith. God is the one who gives us the grace to obey. And so as we step out in faith and say, Lord, by your grace, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to pray for strength, he then increases our faith right. and gives us the added strength. He always helps us do what he wants us to do. Okay. Uh, last question that we have time for this, uh, this morning. Is it okay to follow Christ without joining a denomination? Well, I think it might be a starting point. Anybody can come to Jesus where they are, and I trust and pray that some have done it through these programs or will do it. And, uh, but then you want to be part of a church family because, you know, when a, you're a baby lamb, if you're out in the woods without a fold, you're going to get taken by the wolves. Uh, Jesus says we become part of his body. We are in Christ. And so it is definitely part of God's plan that we should be part of a church family. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a, a part of his perfect plan. And, and of so course, God has given us gifts yeah. and um, different abilities to share and help with others. So we want to utilize that in the church environment. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we just can't be healthy spiritually if we are isolating ourselves. I know a lot of people are doing all their church service online. And I think God can sustain us, but that's not the ideal. Mm -hmm. He says that we are to come together in his name. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We are to convene together. A lot of scriptures say something happens. And there's accountability. And we don't want to lose that accountability. We'd like to remind our friends who are joining us, we do have a free gift for those who are here in North America. If you'd like to receive the book, it's called Conformity and Courage. It's just a great read. You can just text the word COMPROMISE to the number 40544 and we'll send you a link and you'll be able to download the book and read it. If you're outside of North America, again, we just remind you, go to revelationnow.com and you'll be able to download the book and read it for free. That's just revelationnow.com. Compromise, Conformity, and Courage. This is a great, great book, little book written by you, Pastor Doug, dealing with these important themes. Amen. Now, um, our program continues this evening yes. and we have a very important presentation. Uh, we want to make sure that folks plan to be a part of that. Join us at 7 p.m. Pacific time. And you'll need to do the math to figure out what time zone that is, wherever you might be. But Pastor Doug, today, of course, is the 31st uh, of October. It's uh, Halloween, as many people think of it. We're going to be talking about what the Bible says about death. And Bewitching spirits. They don't right. want to miss it tonight. And uh, study. Yeah, it's, it actually comes from Revelation. So look forward to seeing everybody then. what you can